This video is brought to you by Surfshark VPN. Stick around to the end of the video for a special offer they're making available through my channel. Gamers, happy Halo week, or at least I hope it's gonna be happy. Did you guys see that interview with the Halo showrunner where he said, quote, we didn't look at the game. We didn't talk about the game. We talked about the characters and the world, so I never felt limited by it being a game, end quote. That is not a good quote, can I just say. To be fair though, this guy did say that he wrote nearly 300 drafts of the script because he agonized over every detail so much, so I just don't know what to think when it comes to this guy. Let's just hope the show lands well when it debuts this week on Paramount+. Plus. Paramount+, Plus. it's a mountain of that I can't even get through it, so you know what I'm going to say. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an important week in the gaming news calendar because this is pretty much the last big release week of the year. The video games industry didn't exactly pace itself in quarter one, going a little too hard like a teenager who gets really drunk at the pre-drinks and then spends the rest of the night passed out on a park bench. There's always going to be crazy happenings and leaks and gossips and acquisition and Elden Ring memes, but I think things are going to slow down for a little while and after this quarter, that's more than okay with me. But that's later and this is now, so enough of the intro block. Let's get to the news. Slash R Gaming Circle Jerk Rejoice for your next five years worth of content has been revealed. Thanks to the official announcement of The Witcherino 4, sequel to the OG underrated indie gem. Still holds up after all these years, mind you. That's right, this is real. Yesterday, CD Projekt Red took to Twitter to formally announce the next chapter in The Witcher saga, or more specifically, a new saga. With Geralt's story formally concluded in the original trilogy, we can almost certainly expect this story will be led by a different protagonist, a point underscored by the different medallion we see in the snow. The announcement did come with some other important details. First up, the game is being developed in Unreal Engine 5, the go-to next-gen graphics engine that developers are still getting acquainted with. This obviously means that CD Projekt Red will be abandoning the Red Engine that powered their previous titles, including Cyberpunk. But for some reason, CD Projekt Red clarified that the Cyberpunk expansion would still be on the Red Engine and not Unreal 5, a point that really didn't need to be clarified because that's not how game dev works. Anyway, in addition to that, we learned that CD Projekt Red were working closely with Epic as part of a multi-year partnership that aims to, quote, tailor the engine for open world experiences, end quote. That comment is a bit weird and I wonder if we'll hear more about that in future. They did confirm, however, that there are no plans to make the next Witcher game an epic exclusive, though that language certainly doesn't rule out a change of plan in the future. Finally, CD Projekt Red would clarify that no development timeframes or release dates are available at this point, and I really hope it stays that way until the game is 100% ready to ship, because we all know why. I definitely have mixed feelings about this announcement. I love The Witcher as much as the next person, but I was very burned by Cyberpunk. Not because I didn't enjoy it, because frankly, I loved it. But the way that CD Projekt Red developed and delivered that product, it really wiped away all of the affection that I had for that studio. I certainly believe in second chances, and I'm hopeful that this ends up being awesome, but I'm certainly not going to be getting too hyped for this one. Once bitten, twice shy and all that. Gran Turismo 7 arrived a few weeks back now to what was generally thunderous applause. Critics were certainly calling the game a return to form, mirroring the glory days of Gran Turismo 2 and 3, where the franchise was the definitive driving simulator. Oh, how quickly the turn tables, though, as just a few weeks in, Gran Turismo is kind of a laughing stock and a reminder of just how much has been traded away in this era of modern gaming. Because yes, Gran Turismo 7 is very pretty and it's very fun when you can play it, which for many people is a vanishingly small window owing to the game's always online requirement and lengthy server maintenance windows. Yes, you heard that right. Gran Turismo 7 requires an internet connection to play. It is impossible to play any part of it offline. So when Polyphony had to take the servers down for 30 hours this week, nobody was playing Gran Turismo 7. It's genuinely sad to see a once celebrated franchise dip into something as unnecessary and anti-consumer as an always online requirement. I mean, I get that some games need that, sure. This franchise didn't need it back in its heyday, and it sure as shit doesn't need it now. In this important metric, Gran Turismo 7 is an objectively worse product than any of its on-disc offline counterparts, and we have to remember that one day this game just isn't going to exist at all, as the time will come when servers are switched off and Gran Turismo 7 is relegated to that great video game trade-in store in the sky. 
That's not all though. During the review window, there were rumblings from certain reviewers about the microtransaction economy, which allowed people to purchase credits to skip the in-game grind for new and prestigious cars. Obviously, Polyphony said that their in-game reward economy was balanced independently of their microtransaction economy, but that became almost impossible to believe when this week they nerfed the credit gains from certain races since those races were too lucrative. Now it's all been brought down and equalized, and the community have worked out that you can grind the equivalent of $7 an hour worth of in-game currency, making GT7 literally more stingy than working a minimum wage job at Mickey D's or Dirty Bird. Yes, that's what we call KFC over here, by the way. Obviously, this outraged everyone, and the game director issued some weak-ass statements saying that they had to make the good cards expensive because realism or some shit. It was fucking lame, and he got roasted for it. But yeah, that's where GT7 stands now. It's often unplayable, it's grindy, it's full of microtransactions, and it's a live service that has ultimately just cemented the Forza series as the preeminent racing experience in the modern era. With Sony promising more live services in the future, you really gotta hope that this isn't a template for their future future plans. Speaking of Sony, one of its newly acquired studios is finding itself in a bit of a pickle. The studio is a small, formerly indie dev by the name of Bungie, and this week a lot of their creators are getting slapped with copyright takedowns for everything ranging from the use of in-game music to gameplay to Asti Cross who just read out some patch notes with no music or anything and he still got copy struck somehow. That video was deleted, which means I was not only robbed of Asdi Cross's sexy southern twang, but I also had to read the twab for myself. That's like Grandmaster Difficulty twab right there. No thank you. Come back soon, Cross. So everyone is blowing up about Bungie for copy striking all of their shit, but then get this. Bungie's own channel got copy struck. They put out a tweet saying that the strikes weren't at the direction of Bungie or their partners, which indicates that some scamming DMCA bot got a little too trigger happy and didn't know who they were messing with. Bungie says they're investigating the matter and should have it resolved soon. Final piece of Sony news is that they bought another studio this week. At this point, it's like Jim's weekly trip to the grocery store. Eggs, milk, bread, a studio, tomatoes. But don't worry, folks. Jim only shops organic. The studio in question is Haven, the newly formed studio from Jade Raymond. Raymond is a low-key industry juggernaut, helping launch the Assassin's Creed franchise back in the day before setting up Ubisoft Toronto and then EA's Motive Studio. She was eventually poached by Google to lead their games unit when Stadia was still a thing. But when Google jumped ship on that, Jade bailed out of there and set up her own studio, Haven. For a while now, she and her team have been working on a multiplayer-focused live service game that was initially funded by Sony, and it was going to be a PlayStation exclusive. So it looks like Jim just really liked what he saw and said, fuck it, let's go all in. It's the latest in a string of acquisitions from Sony, stuff like Bungie, Bluepoint, Housemark, and others, and is in line with a broader industry trend of consolidation, where big publishers are buying up all the studios they can get their hands on. This is definitely not the last acquisition we'll be hearing about this year, or probably even this month. From Sony news to the house that Bill built, we got a small update on that Perfect Dark story that broke last week. You'll no doubt recall that Video Game Chronicle did a deep dive into the initiative, the development team behind the upcoming reboot, and they found that they are hemorrhaging stuff fast, with over half of the team departing in the last year alone. Video Game Chronicles editor Andy Robertson kept digging this week and confirmed even more departures, but interestingly, he had this to say, quote, If it wasn't obvious already, multiple sources have now suggested to me that Crystal Dynamics is essentially leading this project, end quote. If that's the case, it's hard to see how the initiative, who haven't even shipped a game yet, survived this one. So yeah, if that reporting is accurate, then get ready for Perfect Dark, courtesy of Crystal Dynamics. Let's hope they can knock over this project quickly so they can get back to more important things, aka the Soul Reaver reboot. Todd and his buddies sat down this week, coffee cups in hand, to have a good old chin wag about their upcoming sci-fi open world RPG Starfield. This is, I think, the third of these sorts of videos that the studio has done, where members of the design team share some insight into what we can expect to experience when the game launches in November. This one was a little more informative than the others. For example, we learned that we're going to have starter scenarios that will serve as the foundation for newly created characters, whereas in previous Bethesda games, your character was more of a blank slate. One example provided was that of Ryujin Industries, where if you choose that as your starting faction, you'll begin the game as a newly hired corporate drone, ready to begin climbing the corporate ladder. Todd also made the point that Starfield is a hardcore RPG like Bethesda used to make, which I thought was a really interesting comment. But yes, they did used to make those sorts of games, and if Starfield takes us back to the days of Morrowind, then that's going to go a long way towards helping people forget that unfortunate Fallout 76 incident. Remember that one? 
Those are good times. Last little bit of Xbox news is that if you're one of the lucky three people in the world who managed to get a Steam Deck, then you can now play Xbox Game Pass on it, sort of. This week, Microsoft published a helpful little how-to article explaining how to get Game Pass working on Valve's new handheld via cloud streaming. It's a workaround of sorts since you need to download and configure the Microsoft Edge browser onto your deck, which then allows you to log onto the Game Pass cloud interface just as you would from a browser on a phone or a PC. The Game Pass cloud lineup is pretty solid actually, and so long as you're not playing any Twitch shooters, then the latency should be fine. It's one step closer to something that Valve has already discussed and welcomed, making Game Pass available through Steam by some means, but I'm going to guess that Microsoft aren't too keen on that one since it would mean they'd have to pay Valve 30% of any subscription revenue generated from there. Never say never though. Sadly, there were some disappointing reports about a number of indie studios this week. At almost the same time, the YouTube channel People Make Games and the publication VentureBeat both dropped exhaustive reports detailing cultures of abuse and harassment at a number of indie darlings. Studios like Mountains, Fulbright, Funamina and Moon Studios. Some of this stuff was already known but was greatly expanded upon but the stuff about Moon Studios, makers of the Ori games, was a genuine shock to most. The report talks about an extremely hostile work culture overseen by the two studio founders with a workplace slack discussion that contains stuff so bad that I can't even repeat it here without getting myself demonetized or worse. While the news about Moon was a shock to us, apparently it wasn't a shock to Microsoft, who already knew about Moon's toxic work culture and stopped working with them as a result of it. The news comes from reliable insider Jeff Grubb, who when speaking during his podcast revealed that Xbox were aware of the issues and as a result declined to publish their next game after Ori and the Will of the Wisps. That's why Private Division is publishing their next title, but it's unknown if Private Division were aware of the studio's reputation before signing that deal or what they might do now that this whole thing is public. Alright briefly, let's do a Harry Potter hot take. It looks cool. Really cool in fact. I'm not a Harry Potter fan at all. I read the first two books and then I watched some of the movies, but they're so long. I don't know. They just don't really do anything for me. But even I was feeling spirited away as I watched this footage. The amount of detail that's been poured into every frame is astounding. And it looks genuinely distinct, which is weird because the ye old castle aesthetic is pretty ubiquitous, but they really have found a way to make it theirs here. Combat is looking a little stiff and shaky. The jury is still out on whether or not this will play well, but so far I don't think anyone can argue that this looks incredible. Outside of the gameplay reveal, we got the official word that the game would not have any multiplayer elements, which is kind of a bummer because competitive Quidditch would have been fun. Better news is that the game will not have any microtransactions. Love to see that. Hogwarts Legacy is still on track for release this year, but there's no date locked in yet. Final piece of news, Fortnite. You guys remember that game? Well, it just launched a new season that was a little ill-timed, but Epic have managed to turn lemons into lemonade on this one. Here's the story. Fortnite Chapter 3 Season 2 launched this week, but there was absolutely zero marketing behind it, which was weird. Everyone's like, what's up with that? Well, it turns out that the theme of the season was a war, tanks and blimps and, you know, war stuff. Not the best look given what's currently going on in Ukraine. So what are Epic doing about that? They're donating every dollar of revenue from the game for the next two weeks to Ukrainian humanitarian efforts. In one day alone, this generated 36 million US dollars and they still have 13 days to go. I don't know any other company across any industry that's putting their money where their mouth is quite like that. Like, correct me if I'm wrong and some other company is giving more, but yeah, that's certainly the most I've heard about and I think that's incredibly admirable of Epic. Good job, Tim. So what got announced or delayed this week? Well, after teasing their next project for a few weeks, Supermassive have pulled back the curtain on The Quarry, a new horror experience they say is a spiritual successor to their Until Dawn series. It's Camp Krusty meets Cape Fear as you play as one of a handful of camp counselors, making decisions that will either prolong their lives or cut them comically short. This one is packing some serious heat in the voice acting department, featuring the likes of David Arquette from Scream, Ariel Winter from Modern Family, and Lance Hendrickson from pretty much everything I love. Wasn't expecting this one to be out quite so soon, but it turns out this one is hitting June 10th on all platforms but the Switch. Hard West 2 was announced this week. Not gonna lie, I actually didn't even know that Hard West 1 existed, but now that I've seen this gameplay reveal, I'm likely gonna take a look at the first one. It's basically Cowboy XCOM, and yeah, I'm fine with that, that sounds great. No release date for this one, but it's headed exclusively to PC. Dungeons & Dragons Dark Alliance Shadow dropped its Echoes of the Blood War expansion this week. The update is paid DLC that costs 30 Australian dollars and it adds one new playable character and two new locations to explore. 
I cannot believe that this game is charging 30 Australian dollars for a DLC. When I first heard about it, I was like, oh, it'll probably be a free update. And then when I heard it was paid, I was like, oh, it'll probably be like 10 bucks or something. $30, man, who is buying that? No one, it seems, because at the time of writing, this DLC had a total of four user reviews, despite having been out for nearly a week. 50% of those were negative. Jesus. Speaking of negative reviews, Godfall is coming to Xbox. After over two years as a PlayStation console exclusive, Gearbox announced that their Warframe-esque looter slasher would make its way to Xbox consoles on April 7th. This is the Ultimate Edition, which has... I don't know, man, I don't care. It's definitely gonna have more stuff than the recently released PS Plus Challenger Edition, which basically removed the game's campaign and just let you play with one character at max level. Ridiculous. This is also coming to Steam, meaning that it will be playable on the Steam Deck, which immediately makes the Nintendo Switch the superior handheld, because it cannot play Godfall. That's just science. The other announcements this week were courtesy of two indie showcases, one hosted by Xbox and their ID at Xbox program, and the other by Humble. I wanna do a quick whip around of the best reveals since there's some really great stuff here that I wanna make sure get some light shone on it. Kicking off with the ID at Xbox showcase first, I particularly like the look of Chinatown Detective Agency since I'm always a sucker for a detective story and the pixel art here is looking great. Cursed Golf is from an Australian developer and it seems to be some sort of golf 2D platformer RPG high hybrid thing. One of my favorite Switch games was Golf Story, so I'm down for anything that tries to remix the abjectly boring game of golf into something that's, you know, fun. Flintock Siege of Dawn. Okay, so this one's a big deal because this is the next game from the creators of a little-known Souls-like called Ashen. Ashen was a very special and underrated game since it really distilled the Souls-like subgenre down to its most essential elements and then delivered those in a way that was super accessible to new players with end-to-end -end co op to boot. Great game, and it immediately puts this new title from developer A44 Games on my radar. Lost Eidolons is basically Fire Emblem, but for the Xbox. Obviously, the art style is very different, but the medieval setting, the combat mechanics, and the approach to storytelling all seem pretty one-to-one. -one. That's out in quarter three of this year. Immortality is another one very high on my watch list. This is from Sam Barlow, the dude behind Detective Games' Her Story and Telling Lies. This one focuses on the life of a disappeared starlet, and it'll be interesting to see Barlow's take on different time periods, as his work has to this point focused on the modern day. Very excited for this one. WrestleQuest is a title that immediately makes you go, why the fuck hasn't there already been a wrestling RPG? It just makes too much sense. You play as Randy Muchacho Man Santos and start out as a humble nobody doing community matches and work your way up to the pay-per-view main stage. Lots of colorful characters, lots of trash talk. This looks awesome. The last one that caught my eye was Citizen Sleeper, a narrative-led sci-fi experience inspired by classic tabletop RPGs. Not unlike Disco Elysium, it's all about the role checks as you live life on board a space station known as the Eye, performing maintenance work and dealing with your colleagues as you try and find a way to outlive your planned obsolescence. Nice vibe, great visuals, looking very solid. Humble don't just make a charity bundle, they also publish games and they've got some real bangers on their roster. I mean, check this one out. This is Moonscars, and damn if I didn't do the whole eyes wide meme when I watched this trailer for the first time. I love it when pixel art games go absolutely ham on animations, and these look incredible. The combat as a whole just looks fucking awesome. Cannot wait to get my hands on this one. Ghost Song is a 2D action exploration game that crash lands you on a mysterious location. This one looks to be less about the action and more about the scenery and storytelling, with a lot of voice acting present, which you don't often see from games that look quite like this. Signalus is looking very cool. It's like those PS1 D-Make games that are all the rage right now, and that's pretty accurate since this is meant to be homage to the classic PS1 era survival horror games. The fixed perspective, the low res 3D images, the slow and clunky combat, it definitely takes me back to my Dino Crisis days, so I'm really liking the look of this one. Much like WrestleQuest, Infinite Guitars takes an already awesome concept and then makes an RPG out of it. In this case, Guitar Hero, but an RPG. Yes, please. And finally, I was very impressed with the Iron Oath, which looks to be combining the overworld exploration of Heroes of Might and Magic with a more dense tactical hex-based combat model. Individual units are sporting a lot more variety and flair than your standard medieval fare, and the pixel art here is also looking absolutely fantastic. We're about to enter a AAA dry spell that will last us many months, and I low-key love it when that happens because it hands the mic to indie devs and gives them a moment in the spotlight. 
every game I listed for you here is one that I'm excited to check out. And if you yourself are keen, then be sure to wishlist these titles on Steam as that always helps out developers in a big way. And I think most of the ID at Xbox stuff is hitting Game Pass on day one anyway. So yeah, you can just check it out there if you like, because you know, the price is pretty damn good. So what got released last week, aka the review roundup, well GTA finally got its next gen ports and they're fine, they have better frame rates and resolutions and they run well enough, they're minor visual touch ups over what already existed, only now you get to pay for it all over again. A publisher with any shame would have served these up as free upgrades, but hey, it's old mate Strauss Zelnick we're talking about here, so that was never going to happen. Anyway, bottom line is that if you were worried or hopeful that this would be another GTA trilogy remaster fiasco, then no. These ports are fine. Hey, here's a nice surprise. Turns out Tunic rules. So first up, a lot of people were roasting me in the comment section last week because I said it wasn't coming to Game Pass. And that was accurate at the time because the game was just about to release and Xbox had already announced their upcoming Game Pass lineup for the month and Tunic wasn't in it. Turns out though that Phil is making a bit of a habit of late breaking news upsetting my schedule and Tunic's Game Pass inclusion was announced just after my episode went live during the ID at Xbox showcase. So yes, Tunic is on Game Pass and it rules. It currently sits at a mighty 85 on OpenCritic and 91% very positive on Steam, making it one of the highest rated indie titles of the year. More than the scores though, people just seem to be a little bit in love with it, as it gently tugs at nostalgia strings while delivering a modern and adult take on the classic adventure formula. IGN scored it a 9, saying, quote, Tunic is an unapologetically challenging action adventure game that is charming, multi-layered and immensely rewarding to solve, end quote, while Game Informer went nearly all in, scoring it a 9.8 and saying, quote, Tunic brilliantly captures the feeling of that special childhood title that made you fall in love with video games, end quote. They're talking about Zelda, by the way. Amazing result for a debut title from a new indie developer. Anno Mutationum arrived for PlayStation and PC last week, and reviews for this one came in about where I expected them to, a fair 73 on Open Critic and a mixed 69 on Steam. Nice. Push Square scored it a 6 out of 10 saying quote, While the ambition is admirable, overall we feel the game comes across as quite unfocused. It's an enjoyable experience and everything here is reasonably good, but the result is a game that doesn't really shine, save for its rainy, neon infused aesthetic, end quote. That very much mirrors my impressions of it. The game reaches for a lot and does all of it pretty well, so you'll enjoy yourself, but I kind of think it lacks that defining characteristic or element that'll really leave a mark on you. Finally, Shredders is that snowboarding game that hit Xbox and PC, available day one on Game Pass. This one too met with okay reviews, currently 70 on Open Critic, but a much more impressive 94% very positive on Steam. I can't really explain that disconnect to be honest. Survivor scored it a solid 8 saying quote, I'm not an avid snowboarder fan by any means, but I found Shredders to be a delight, a quick and rewarding pick up and play title that I can jump into for some quick runs after bashing my head against Elden Ring for far too long. It's full of fun, humor, and generally a delight to play, end quote. So what's coming out this week? Well, I mentioned earlier that we're headed into a AAA dry spell, and this is pretty much the last stacked week we're gonna see for many, many months. For real, I look ahead at the video game release schedule, and until some new games get revealed or release dates locked in, which will happen, this is the last big week of the year, so let's enjoy it I guess. First up is a port, but a very worthwhile one. The Ascent had hitherto been an Xbox and PC exclusive. That window has now closed and the game will be available for both PS4 and PS5 on the 24th. This is a fantastic game. I know a lot of people didn't love it, but I certainly did. I thought its isometric cyberpunk aesthetic was astoundingly good, its action was very solid, and it had some of the best sound design of any game last year. This is also co-op, so that's nice. It's a really great all-rounder, and if you have people to play with, then I really recommend checking this one out, but also even if you're just playing on your own, since it still holds up. Expedition Zero is a survival horror game set in a creepy snow-covered forest where bad things are going down and you need to get to the bottom of it all. The game recently featured as part of the Steam Next Fest, where it got some positive buzz. It looks nice, and it's hitting PC on the 25th. Fourth. One of this week's heavy hitters is Ghostwire Tokyo, the semi-open world occult-infused action game from developer Tango Works, the team behind the Evil Within. It's looking interesting, certainly the design side of it looks amazing, a totally distinct setting and vibe that I'm very into. The game side of it though, I don't know, and the release of reviews today kind of confirmed my suspicion. The title is currently sitting at a strong 77 on Open Critic, and reviews do point to some fairly middling gameplay. Case in point, IGN scored it a 7, saying, quote, With superb visual design and an incredibly well-realized rendition of Tokyo, Ghostwire gets a lot right, but just doesn't quite have the gameplay chops to push it over the top, end quote. 
Game Central really brutalized the title, scoring it a 4 out of 10 and saying, quote, Rarely has such a big budget game been based on such a thin gameplay premise, with this bafflingly dull first person action adventure that begins to run out of steam by the end of the tutorial level. Ouch. Might want to hold off on this one until it hits Game Pass or something. Now please, ladies and gentlemen, I would ask you to keep your mind firmly out of the gutter as we discuss the next release, Kirby and the Forgotten Land, aka Mouthful Mode Simulator 2022. Nintendo have finally realized that sex sells and have served up a feature so salacious that Lady Dimitrescu herself is jealous she didn't think of it. Outside of this feature, Kirby looks to be a fun time with a character that Nintendo fans have been missing. It is of course exclusive to the Nintendo Switch and it's out on the 25th. Right now I'm playing through Tiny Tina's Wonderlands and I'm going to have a review out for that one this week, though I don't think I can share the embargo timing for that one yet, so just hit the subscribe button, ding the notification bell, and you won't have to worry about the timing. I'll just let you know as soon as it's up. Tiny Tina's Wonderland is a Borderlands spin-off where you're dropped into a Dungeons & Dragons tabletop match and Tina is the DM. The game foregoes Borderlands post-apocalyptic setting in favor of a fairy tale esque medieval one, making former Gearbox boss Randy Pitchford very happy because if there's one thing that Randy loves, it's medieval times. Tiny Tina is hitting PlayStation, Xbox and the Epic Games Store on the 25th. Finally, Lost Judgment fans, please hold your booing, I come in peace. The Kaito Files, a DLC that puts you in the floral shirt of Yagami's punch-happy offsider, arrives on both PlayStation and Xbox on the 28th. It looks like a good time, and it may even serve as a warm-up round to the potential Judgment 3 sequel, if Sega can't work out a deal with Judgment's current protagonist's agent who is for some reason not willing to have Judgment come to PC. It's really weird. So Kaito might become Judgment's leading man. This is his big audition for that. Don't screw it up, big guy. Put this on your radar. I can't do this anymore. Nothing I can do to change your mind. Now you are welcome to try. Okay, so this is Adios, and it's a game that's been out for a while now on PC. It's only just been released on the Switch, and I wanted to give it a shout out because I played through this last year, and it was one of the best written games I played last year. It was actually in my Game of the Year contender list, but sadly it just got edged out by other titles. But I really agonized over that choice because Adios is special. You play as a pig farmer who to that point has spent many years working for the mob, disposing of corpses by feeding them to your pigs. One day though, you decide that that life must end, and what transpires is a series of conversations between you and a mafioso who's desperate to convince you to keep working. Not because he values your service, but because he knows that if he can't convince you, you're going to die, and he'll have to be the one that kills you. I don't like the way that most video games are written. Most of them are not written at an adult reading level. They leave nothing ambiguous, nothing unsaid. Adios is a quiet, beautifully written game that is more about the space between words than the words themselves. There is very little gameplay here and it only runs for about two hours or so, but I guarantee you, you'll remember those two hours where you'll forget like 98% of the writing present in most other games, particularly AAA games. It's just hit Switch, it's out on PC, I'll leave a link to the Steam page below. Sort of free stuff time, and there's only two things to tick off this week as we await the monthly refreshes, which should be announced next week. First up, Epic. Right now, they're giving away the psychedelic horror game In Sound Mind, which, as I mentioned last week, has some fantastic reviews over on Steam, so it's likely worth checking out. Grab that quick, because on the 25th, the giveaway will become Demon's Tilt, a cult pinball action. It's a pinball game. I don't really know what else to say other than it's a pinball game. So yeah, knock yourself out. Now this next item isn't free, nor is it sort of free, but it's so damn cheap that it may as well be free. And it's also for an extremely worthwhile cause. This here is the Stand With Ukraine bundle from Humble Bundle, and it is a little crazy. You thought that the Itch.io bundle was impressive? Well, it was, but this is just as impressive and maybe more so. Prices vary based on local currency, but for as little as 55 Australian dollars, you're getting over three and a half thousand dollars worth of games. And these are some proper video games, man. Satisfactory, Back for Blood, Metro Exodus, Spyro Trilogy, Max Payne 3, Sunset Overdrive, Quantum Break, Fable. The list goes on and on and on and on. Owing to the generosity of the donating publishers and developers, 100% of your payments will go to humanitarian relief efforts to the people of Ukraine, so that is good. Important to note that this bundle is only live for the next few days, so if you do want to grab it, then grab it now because it will be gone very, very soon. Our feel-good story for the week comes courtesy of my friend Alana Pierce, as well as Steven Spawn, who I know and we chat and stuff, but 
I don't know if we're friends. I mean, I hope we're friends because he's really cool, but I might say, hey, we're friends. And he'd be like, uh, no, we're not. And I'd be like, oh, okay, I understand. Why does this keep happening to me? Anyway, this isn't a therapy session for Shill Up. This is a feel-good story for the week. And this week's feels matter because they celebrate an important topic that is getting more and more recognition, accessibility. This week, Alana and Steve hosted the Video Game Accessibility Awards over on Alana's channel. The event celebrates the work of developers who put in the extra effort to make their games more accessible to people with a disability. Stuff like high contrast modes, extremely customizable in-game options, text display options, and increased AI assistance. Winners included Halo Infinite, Guardians of the Galaxy, Before Your Eyes, Forza Horizon 5, Far Cry 6, It Takes Two, Final Fantasy XIV, Endwalker, and Life is Strange True Colors, showing that accessibility is not at all a fringe subject, but becoming increasingly front and center for some of the biggest games on the market today. The ceremony itself was a low-key affair, snazzy outfits, and plenty of pizza to go around, but the guest list was anything but low-key since Ryan Reynolds was there to present an award for an absolute legend, and big ups to Alana and Steve for lassoing in that sort of talent. If you'd like to check out the awards for yourself, I'll leave a link to the YouTube video below. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the week in video games. Apologies that the Destiny review is late, but it's ending up a little longer than I had initially planned. And yes, it's long. It's nearly done, and it'll be out this week after the Tiny Tina review. So it's a huge week of content, actually. If you'd like to be here for all of it, then be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you'll know when those vids are up. If you liked this video, then you can do your boy a huge solid by liking the video and leaving a comment below with your favorite Ben and Jerry's flavor. I was always a Tonight Doe starring Jimmy Fallon man until that NFT bit with Paris Hilton. Now I'm a Colbert Americone dream man. Love you and leave ya. Shell up out. Guys, I know we're all hyped for the Halo TV show this week, but what if you live in a country where that's not going to be available because it's geoblocked and no other platform is carrying it for you? How are you going to dunk on the creepy non-blue Cortana with the rest of us if you can't even watch the show? This is a problem that affects a lot of shows in a lot of places. Australia, for example, there is a lot of stuff, both movies and TV, that doesn't hit our streaming services, or it hits very late, and that sucks. Luckily, there is a way around all that, and that way is Surfshark VPN. Surfshark lets you trick your internet into thinking you're in one place, but you're actually somewhere else. Magic, I know. But the bottom line is that it lets you sidestep geoblocks so you can watch whatever the hell you damn please. In addition to that stuff, Surfshark is also the best means of protecting your online data. Your passwords, your IP address, your personal information, that's all over the World Wide Web. And in 2021, we can't just not think about that. We have to take steps to protect our data the same way we protect the credit cards we keep in our wallets. Surfshark VPN encrypts your online data, protecting you from identity thefts and hacks, and their clean web feature automatically blocks over 1 million known malicious websites, phishing methods, and other threats. You can use Surfshark on multiple devices at once, which is something that almost no other VPN allows. It's available on pretty much every platform you can think of. It has 24 seven customer support, and it has a full 30 day money back guarantee. Best of all, they're offering an 83% discount and three months free when you use offer code SKILLUP at checkout. Click the link in the description below or visit surfshark.deals forward slash skillup. Thanks Surfshark for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.